The wild of my dissimilarity to other boys and the ecstatic bliss I felt wearing dresses, playing with toys prescribed for the female gender and disappearing into imaginary worlds with female friends who accepted my imaginary long hair and choices of dress. I took it upon my 11-year-old self to deny my authenticity and silence my feminine to survive in a city state school. Fully aware, aware I cannot continue, continue to express my feminine self, self as I live by fear of death, by being, being cast out as a batting man in the school corridors. I said to myself, I must, I must, be, a I must be a boy. Here lies the crime on the queer child. A society forces decisions on them with impacts that are barely comprehensible as self-inflicted fissioning and oppression of identity. Unprocessed shame festers in shadow and lingers behind doors in familiar hauntings as the queer child remains recoiled under societal pressure with nothing to identify with, continually stripping themselves of inappropriate behaviour, like the dress in the photograph, half unzipped as if it were a skin to be shed and departed from as a body becomes undeniably male. The gender divide experienced as children can result in complex traumas, as the extreme gendering insisted by the patriarchal binary system affects everyone in its expectation, adherence to prescribed gender roles, celebrating the strong, desensitized masculine and insisting the feminine is disempowered and silenced. Who? 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 As I was walking up the stairs, I met a man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. Oh, how I wish he'd go away. The Antigonish poem by Mearns has been etched into my psyche since I was six years old. Like a corpse that won't sink, it has risen from my subconscious repeatedly. Buoyant in subjective bloat, it has resurfaced through my art practice, and its potency continues to penetrate and transmute my being like a charm of making. A charm with a transient nature that sets the staircase as a liminal site of mind and body, a borderland where memory and daily domesticity repeatedly meet in a labyrinthine polarity. Recurring themes constellate this site and linger on steps and entwine the banisters. The presence of absence, otherness, shadow and the wound can all be found in my works where I explore the site of the staircase, the who and the how it haunts. In my practice I use myself as an auto muse a suspect and specimen, an archaeological site to be investigated and exposed as my suspicions of the inquiry are an effect of the gender binary, evidenced by the need for this self-definition made possible by the work. My identity and body are at the heart of my work, as I am a site of truth to be mastered, in the panopticon where reflections stretch infinitely back and forth, but none are a reflection of me. This is the feeling that estrangement and assigned gender creates in a binary society. A sense of identity as other. Foucault framed the panopticon as a metaphor for society and its collective voyeurism and perpetual surveillance, examination and normalization as a self-policing system within a greater system of power. My performance of posing is an ambiguous embodiment within this system entangled in a binary language of interpretation that evidences my disposition and opposition that I make public, primarily through social media. Social media is another panopticon, dualistically democratic and coercive, as a voyeuristic mode of self-identification through narcissistic validation, achieved via the gaze and applause of gained followers. This does allow for expressions of authenticity, but simultaneously an uncanny production of personal propaganda is being produced as heavily filtered, doll-like avatars often become a mutated vehicle of enhancement to interact with the world of surveillance. This reflective environment of social media can be framed as a heterotopia. Foucault's heterogeneous sites within society that simultaneously reflect and subvert the system through their nature and purpose. My favourite of Foucault's heterotopias is the mirror. From the standpoint of the mirror, I discover my absence from the place where I am since I see myself over there. For me, this describes how it feels to not see yourself in the world and the binary categorizations, to experience yourself as a presence of absence. This is how I frame the non-binary other in society, as a living heterotopia. There is a hermeneutic injustice of language for other gendered identities who are situated in these liminal spaces as self-defining paradoxes. We speak a different language. They say representation, we say experimentation. They say identity, we say multitude. 
burgeoning epistemology is manifest from these borderlands agenda by literary lifesavers, Wilchins, Preciado and Bornstein, whose texts have enlightened this phenomenological inquiry. Activists and artists querying surveillance and examination in a revolution of dialectics and exhibitionism, using language that describes without prescription and situates complexity as the constant and reliable centre of culture and society. Stringent structures oppose my methods, multiplicities and manifesto. As an explicit autonomy, I struggle to surmise my cognizance into a neatly packed thesis question for this memoir. It is here that I non-conform to the academic structure that has transpired to be as stifling as achieving a perfect mould for a wax cast to be extracted from, whether unknowing and surrender to expectation were the vital components in the manifesting. My problem is also my privilege. As a white assigned male at birth person that presents and is received as male, living openly with a homo sensibility, I do not suffer racism or misogyny and their impacts. But on appearance I am not seen, and no one would be aware of my intrapsychic conflicts and the impacts that being gendered whilst navigating cis-heteronormative spaces has on my authentic sense of self. Intervention. The alchemy of ideas compobulating the subconscious is as important in my process as the physical act of making. Psychic ingredients need time to simmer and produce unique coagulations in the subconscious. I intervene in and upon as phrases merge and are obsessively typed into my phone as the seeding of auto poems that become soundscapes, films and projected portraiture. Works with resonant frequencies oscillating in a conversation between the psyche and the transpersonal. My methodologies employ transgressive interventions on imagery of myself as an inquiry that unfolds new information to be mapped and evidenced. Visual sketchbooks for intuitive collaging help me work through ideas and push them further. I use my archive imagery and shoot new portraits, experimenting with pose and emotion as a research methodology. I rip myself up and stick me back together again, performing surgery with masking tape and procedures of collapsing time through separations and reunions on the page. These interventions cut like a knife and open up wounds in revelations that say, look what you made me, speaking for the first time to society of the true depth of the infliction on the queer child and their ancestry of otherness, surfacing through archetypal symbols like the Medusa, who reveals performative patterns and their meanings. How, 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 how much does it cost the subject to be able to tell the truth about itself? The wound. The wound. Trauma is embedded in the lived experience of lesbian, gay, bi, trans, queer, intersex and asexual and all queer identities under the LGBTQIA plus umbrella and requires continual unpacking and reorientation with self whilst contextualizing identity. This was evident in the virtual retreat for gay men called Who Am I that I took part in for research. Sharing thoughts and feelings with a group of men was a unique experience and our commonality was our trauma. Although we often forget or deny it, gay men have been hounded by stigma for centuries. And both the traumatizing stigma itself and the internalized shame it propagates are the prime obstruction to gay men's realization. The exact details of trauma changed between stakeholders, but what came up repeatedly was the dismissal of feminine behavior in childhood and adulthood. Western power systems, colonialism, race invention and white supremacy have created a masculinity that in part can be held to account for gender-based violence, homophobia, transphobia and gender inequality. My work discusses these complexities of enforced and embedded shame for queer and gender non-conforming identities that during childhood can transgressively be felt as a curse. I name these multitudes the wound to discuss their presence and communication through a broad syntax. In my work, the wound is faceted and prismatic, transgressive and disarming, existing to be dismantled and reformed, reproduced and understood through making. I am evidencing existence and dissociation through affirmative capturing of a cognizant nature. With every portrait, a reorientation with the wound is formed and the discussion is further constellated. Krauss citing Bass describes the wounding effect of photography as the punctum, a puncturing of consciousness and realization of mortality in the capturing of a living subject. As the eyes of a youthful beauty immortalized in a photograph are actually the certification of death through evidencing of life, a 
petrifying realization of mortality, another presence of the wound. Photography is not simply being described here as testimony, the one medium that can power belief in the fact that its reference really existed. Rather, photography is now being reoriented to, to, towards death. The symbol of the wound is an icon of cursedness and sacrifice in mythology and can be seen in Jesus' wounds in their palms and feet from the penetrative nails that fix bodies to crucifixes and birth the wound of stigmata in devout and fanatical religious followers. An iconic wound more likely to be self-inflicted than divinely acquired in an aggressive act of ritual self-harm to make sacred one's own body a reconciliation with servitude to trauma through the wound symbol. The wound is the arrows puncturing the flesh of the martyr Saint Sebastian, penetrations that have been heavily homoeroticized by photographers Pierre Agile and director Derek Jarman as evidence of the archetypal wound's resonance through its adoption as a motif of trauma processed as fetish by the gay community. The wound is dynamic and employed by psychoanalytic theory to discuss archetypal allegories. The holes punctured into the heels of Oedipus by his father are a double rendering of the cursed wound and reason and method for the violent abuse upon his unavoidable nature. In Ballard's crash, wounds gained in car crashes are the entry point to the subversive eroticism as self-induced portals of penetration and departure from normalization. The wound is female genitalia in the presence of absence in Mulvey's diagnosis of the misogynistic transgendering of the female body to signify the dismembered phallus of men's anxiety. The wound is the curse upon Medusa and her severed head, a double guillotine of trauma as her sentence of silenced femininity is fetishized to symbolize man's own fear under Freud's castration complex, serving a double blow to the wound. For Sisu, Medusa's trauma is transformational and laughs in the face of Freud as through the banishment of the feminine to shadow, the anima arises in violent visions as the oppressed gendered feminine that I argue exists in all men and is the uprising wound of masculinity under patriarchy. Everything the anima touches becomes numinous, unconditional, dangerous, taboo, magical. The anima and her counterpart, the animus, are the female and male aspects of the self that exists in a person and is opposite to their assigned sex. The anima lives in shadow, but is a numinous archetype that when psychoactively triggered has a dualistic, intense character that must be reconciled with in a person's individuation process. It is not simply the case that the feminine is repressed, but conversely, and even more importantly, that the repressed is gendered feminine. Discovering this analysis was a hallelujah moment for my practice as I realized the repressed gendered feminine was omnipresent in my artworks, also compounding the resonance of the recurring Medusa symbol that has become a totemic guide in my practice and theory as channeled through Freud and Sisu. In my previous career as a fashion designer, my muses were always women of tragedy, the scorned witch Medea, Rachel, the uncanny replicant from Ridley Scott's Blade Runner, she of Lars von Trier's Antichrist and of course the cursed Medusa, whom I first encountered as a child in Desmond Davis' film Clash of the Titans. These are all, these are all narratives of women who were cursed, imprisoned and vengeful, but I would come to realize the all uncanny projections of my internal conflict and resonance with the women. To Sue's Medusa laughs at the cognitive dissonance of man's subconscious denial of their transgressive projections of their anima as fetish symbols, romanticized and given license through patriarchal art production, ignorant to their misogynistic productions of the wound, in which the specter of the castrated female, using a phallic substitute to conceal or distract attention from her wound, haunts the male unconscious. Man-made imagery is celebrated by men because in a subliminal syntax it both communicates their denial and enforces their masculinity through the punishment of the gendered female form. Mulvey and Krauss see the reproduction of male genitals as an iteration of power and insecurity, as transformations disguised as hypersexual women, as objects in dissonance to their shadow animals who are continually buried under the historical denial of masculinity as a gendered performance. A performance and silencing of the feminine is perfectly illustrated in Joan's work. What? 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 Every photograph is a catastrophe. The catastrophe. I use self-portraiture as a research methodology where I am subject 
object and participant. So I can see myself as I can't when I look at everyday photographs that other people have taken. In those images, I don't recognize myself. What I see is the man on the stairs who wasn't there. Through self-portrait photography, I'm developing the focus and recompense with every previous performance caught on camera by someone else. I have experienced myself as a heterotopia. In response to the hermeneutic injustice and expanding analysis, I begin to refer to myself as a what? A querying of the who, how, why, academic analysis with the subjective object that fissions multiplicities under umbrella terminologies. I invented this term through mind mapping on queer identity and symbols, asking who and how and in turn what can we worship. The prevalent absence of an answer could only be filled by my presence as I became the what ingesting the why in the annexed preoccupation of this memoir with making sacred dispositions to normalization. Self-portraiture is about sacrifice and control, making sacred one's autonomy through confrontation of the process and the outcome exposing the wound and embracing the punctum of the photograph to create the encounter as a meeting of presence and absence, shadow and anima, embodiment and performance, entwined and trembling. The preoccupation with photographing oneself when situated as a heterotopia evidences existence and its testimony to the durational experience of contextualization as other. For the human heterotopia, it is familiar to ask, what am I? As I don't recognize myself in the societal reflection because the image is not an authentic projection. Am I a man or a woman or a what? So follows the need to create authentic imagery as a form of realization and becoming, reconciling the dissociation of the self that is inflicted upon by the gaze and normalization that situates a transposition with no anchor. Artistic representation allows an imaging of a felt self using emotion as materiality to express internal multiplicities. Manifesting your own ambiguous image to be seen in a society, culture or context where you don't see yourself is fraught and complicated. The redescription of intrapsychic processes in terms of the surface politics of the body implies a corollary redescription of gender as the disciplinary production of the figures of fantasy through the play of presence and absence on the body's surface. The construction of the gendered body through a series of explosions and denials signifying absences. Under Holub's dehumanizing gaze, it is esoteric narcissism that detects the need to fill these absences appearing as hollow chasms of the wound on the surface of embodiment to comprehend and legitimize a being continually enduring schismatic ontological explosions from the process. The work is the evidence and a reminder of the case in hand. Who defends the rights of the queer child? Self-portraits by queer artists are unavoidably exposing and political by their nature as representations of minority voices and subcultures. Even an improvised portrait, a selfie, on social media is layered with the intention to make real, legitimize and exist in disruption to cis agendas by default. In the exhibition arena, there is a personal confrontation with public space as otherness becomes a spectacle of desire in a transient vitality of storytellings that aren't normally heard or seen. The soft the soft slide. Slide. Here I discuss two images by queer photographers as they resonate with my practice as a becoming, specific to thematics characterised by narrative tools that offset violent undertones where sexuality, gender and fetishism make up the subjective landscape. There is an air of the uncanny to the images, both are queering art history through subverting notions of their own otherness as oppressed bodies in a compositional dialectic of romance, tradition and cultural codification. The photograph's composition places the body as a horizon and the audience enter as something has just happened. Both imply a sexual nature as violence and consent hang questionably in the air. And the aesthetic tools of romance drape and gather the complexity of the images into focus. In Maplethorpe's portrait, the plastic sheet appears behind the gimp. Delicate like the wall of a womb holding an in utero life form, the tension on the material made apparent through shadows cast on the translucent surface that have an explosive quality, like rays of light emanating from the inky black figure, similar to a religious icon. 
The figure is covered head to toe in rubber, latex and leather like a castrated cocoon. Only the one leg propped up tells us this body is alive, while the arm hanging to the floor is reminiscent of Jacques-Louis David's The Death of Marat. In Mohali's work, black rubber is replaced by black skin, another surface of subversion and volatile freedoms that the artist emphasises by increasing the contrast of their self-portraits. A body that has been oppressed, historically enslaved and fetishised through its otherness. The white fabric at the white gaze of post-colonialism amplifying the contrast of their black skin against the environment. But this is a body that challenges the binary identity of women, implying the performative element of the pose and the image's potential as a narrative reconstruction. Maholi is slightly propped up and looking forward, as if at some other presence. We enter into the scene as an action has just occurred. There is an unease to their pose. Fabric and pillows seem to have been tussled with and dragged between their spread legs to keep them apart, suggesting someone has just left the bed and is out of view. But here occurs again a presence of absence. Their head wrap speaks of history and tradition, anachronistically folding time in the drapes of fabric where the garment, sheets and pillows create a textural surface for dismembered limbs to emerge from. The anachronistic value of the image creates layers of subjectivity for the viewer and the artist's own interaction with the work. The staged pose, material, and physical attributes of beauty romanticize the audience engagement with a work that is queering the gaze. Reclining in the I thought, I'll crop up my head and remove the obvious gender markers. Like Mahali, my body challenges the gender and genital prescriptions and identity, creating complex representation Harder to define than a gimp or other fetishisms that pervade homoerotic and subversive artworks. Reflecting on myself as a reclining nude on the stairs, I see a response to a body assigned male. Poised in harmony with my surroundings, reminiscent of classical paintings and female nudes reclining on sofas. The schism of masculine femininity is the intrigue as it juxtaposes the seductive references of surrealism, analogue processing, vintage photography and erotica of unseen bodies adorned with tattoos. I decided not to crop out my head, as the camera obscuring it allows for anonymity that transforms my presence into a syntax. The confrontational aspect of self-portraiture is the meat on the bones of this nude and demands the question of what is that? The camera obscuring the face is the Medusa's head, the potent symbol of gendered silence and uprising. Now operating the punctum device itself, automating the lens that reveals the wounds of the othering, symbolic of the inquiry but requisition to anonymity and the plurality of my potential as what. As Medusa, I am transpersonal participant in a collective burgeoning that is evidencing its absence through presence and explicit explosions of autonomy. Structural the theory of structural integrity emanates from the paradoxical poem about the man on the stairs who wasn't there. As a child, I framed the man to be my father, who had left the family home after my parents' divorce. With hindsight, I can see the man on the stairs was also a reflection of me. The man on the stairs is the patriarchal society and its wound on masculinity. The man on the stairs is me as the expectant absence at the same time as I am the child of presence, embodying a polyamorous dysfunction with no grounding from external resources or structures to contextualize oneself as I force myself to perform my prescribed gender into repetition, prescribed in my behavior emerged and became embodied in an uncanny way. The wish represents the incoherence of my trauma towards my disposition of otherness and the guilt I felt toward my own gendered male absence as well as the absence of my father and the zooming why out the rejection of the queer child by religion. The poem encapsulates the wound. The stairs become a symbolic limbo space signifying a central polarity and paradox. A heterotopia suspended between descendant and transcendent function bearing the tension of the familiar haunting of shadow and domesticity for the asking of structural integrity. The main image by light by projecting previous works conjures psychic apparitions, like familiar hauntings being energized by penetrations of light as phantasmagoria. I pass over the projection to be caught in the camera's timer, casting the memory into a physical transient plane, ascending the stairs, 
when many are lying down, conjuring the internal to the surface as uncanny repetitions of form emanate from the darkness. When transient image appears like an organ, fleshy ambiguity passing through the frame. The bulb of the projectors partnered with digital cameras have an animal materiality as pixelated grains cast prisms of color that bring electronic saturation. Simultaneously, cold illumination emits a static frenzy of particles that create my cadaver-like form as a light stain in the embodiment of past captures. As the staircase resides at the bridge between polarized states of religion, myth, and domesticity, slicing the body into negative space. The light particles are radiating pixels and grains, like the cells of the emotion held in imagery. The projected image creates a continuum of time unfolding through space, and an anachronistic dance of the ephemeral creates the ethereal, like a portal to spirit via digital electronics. The computer drive becomes the cognizant organ of the psychic avatar, illuminating the sight of the heterotopia. The gaze is better shifted and dehumanizing. In my desire to move beyond the binary, I knew how to start by using my research methodologies of documenting, collaging, and mapping to dismantle the impact it had, had on my work. The primary research question for my sculpture series, Heal, was how do we gender a thing? In our constant objectification of the subjective, what are the markers and codes that deny gender? I focused on my foot as subject because of its sexual ambiguity and attributed gender through coded attributes like nail varnish and shoes. A high heel stiletto is explicitly understood as feminine and gendered female. Working on my foot also stayed true to my practice of self-portraiture. To transform my AMAB foot into a non-ambiguously female foot, I began a series of footed nails. A process of slicing through photographs I had taken of my feet and pivoting the pieces in a process of expansion and retraction trying to achieve a very specific shape that it would take on if it were wearing a very high heel shoe to explicitly codify women. The act of attainment of the shape felt quite violent by nature and made me think of the physical attainment of gender, embodied and performed. At this point in my research, two main subjects interested me. Where does this hypersexualized, erotically charged image of a female foot in a high heel shoe come from? And how does this seemingly violent act of attainment, the physical cutting and reforming of the foot, impact upon and reveal new spaces as evidenced in the photographs? The very specific front arch that is the iconic form of the most unachievable shape has its roots in fantasy artworks, as illustrations from John Willie's fetish magazine Bazaar and cartoon characters like Jessica Rabbit from Robert Zemecki's film Who Framed Roger Rabbit. The latter evidence in the patriarchal gaze with traces of misogyny, conditioning the reach of children's aspirations to unachievable, hypersexualized gender markers, can exist in a future question. The iconic iteration of a female foot is a highly fetishized symbol of the productive male gaze, a gender marker that is coded feminine and signifies sexual subordination, masquerading under aesthetic fashion and empowerment. Western artists and their works have a huge part to play in this transgressive variation of the world's fantasy, the cultural identity, and expectations of gender performance. The most effective fetish both constricts and admits binds and raises, particularly high heeled shoes, corsets, the blouse, and as a trimming, high neck bands holding the head erect. The pop artist Alan Jones' work features many erect legs and feet in the style, arching forward in impossibly high heels, sculpted, moulded, and painted female body parts clad seamlessly in leather, the semiotics of bondage, with limbs suddenly dismembered by energetic brushes of paint as their heads spin around in casts. Mulvey cases a damning dissection of artist Jones' corpus of female imaginaries, understanding them as a fetishistic series of corpses, symbolic of the castrated penises described by Freud as men's greatest projection of anxiety, transgendering the female form into a phallic tombstone, the feminine had every opportunity. In my previous careers of fashion design, my work spoke in the language of fetish too. Corsets, impossibly high heels, leather masks, chains and buckles. Violent blows that were often partnered with symbols of romance, draped chiffon and silk, 
intricate embroidery and hand-cut lace that softened the blow and cushioned the manipulations of idealized form and image. Another projection of denial through the dressing up of the wound and oppressed anima. I often wear corsets that I have made in self-portraits in a reflexive conversation about the loaded garment between historical subjugation of the female form and codification within queer narratives. A corset represents constraint that has transformed over decades into a luxury and fetish object, appearing on haute couture runways and cinching bodies into drag performances. The corset was a domestic torture device and misogyny that parallels with the restraint of identities and gender subversion in queer history. In my work, I now see it as another expression of the silenced feminine, suffocated in psychic bondage. Because of the corset, a physical oppression of breath is felt whilst negotiating the capture. The portrait becomes its own torture device, a transgressive method of sadism and punctum of the esoteric narcissist to reveal a paradox within the attainment of the image that mirrors the violent acts of attainment of ideal forms generated by the gender binary previously discussed in the photograms. Paradox is a characteristic of all transcendental situations because it alone gives adequate expression to their indescribable nature. Through my encounter with Sisu and Beard's silence gendered feminine, it has become clear to me that from a young age I was expressing melancholy through paradoxical imagery as a result of my gendered silencing. Not able to fully understand the misogyny of the romanticized torture devices, I came to employ in disguised productions of the uncanny imagery, as the societal cursedness felt as a queer child projected itself from the wound as anima and shadow creatures. In the uncanny, Freud details the resonance of manifest beings that are at odds between the physical and the psyche, spectral and imagined figures, the desire to mirror or duplicate oneself that was present in my work through the layering of image projection, bodily capture and play between embodiment and performance. In psychoanalysis of art where an anima could be present, we are commonly drawn back to childhood, which is a recurring site of inquiry in my works. Unsettling juxtapositions of juvenile infancy and eroticism, as seen in Hans Bellmer's doll series, illustrate these complexities, as dolls are one of the major gender markers of appropriate gendered behaviour for children. We make sure our daughters look distinctly feminine and that our boys don't cry or play with dolls. Many boys experience the trauma of a negative response to their enjoyment of dolls, a trauma that is cast into shadow to become part of their anima. Explaining the recurrence of the doll symbol in adulthood as an expression of the silent feminine. Six, 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 dog, dog, dog. This emotional tone can be seen in my film Six Legged Dog, where I perform to my auto poem Sound Piece with different symbolic avatars representing childhood as the doll, fetish as the stiletto, and the uncanny manifest forms of my heel sculptures. They inhabit an ambiguous derelict space, uncannily eerie and familiar in itself a psychogeographical site, a shadow gut gestating the wound. To amplify the atmosphere of displacement, I have synthesized and layered my voice to orcas and dolphins in the sound design. Contrasting the clicking and whining in the shadowy vast depths of the ocean, a symbol of the subconscious, to disdainful crackled echoes of my voice reciting the auto poem that seeded the film. I automated the avatars using a turntable Flashing red lights and a fisheye lens, the strobe effect fracturing the dismembered avatars further, confusing the eyes, forms flash in and out of darkness like a chase from police cars in pursuit of the criminal acts of infantile queerness. In childhood, dolls allow for an amount of image projection for role play, experiencing dominance and submission, behaviours that when recur through the adult gaze produce the uncanny, rendering a sexualised view that is seemingly perverse as is absent of juvenile innocence, and as with Belma's doll, it is a man-made creation, automated for domination and exploitation. The doll's psychic charge from childhood desire becomes fetishized by default through a binary and cis-adult gaze that reduces the subjectivity, and at the same time as a kind of shadow cast by profound absence, even through dismembered multiplications. A void of expression stagnates, rooted in the oppression of childhood desire and manifest through adult autonomy, an incongruence to the subversion that results in a lack, that to me creates the resonance to a lens that challenges the gender binary. For the same reason there is a potential for audiences to experience a disconnection to the ambiguous atmospheres in my works, 
as I actively seek to impress a disconcertation and dysphoric tone as insight to their subjectivity. The photograms were extremely valuable as they unfurled voids of negative space through the exposure and contraction of psychological navigation. Exposure of identity is often met with contention, resulting in an introversion and a resounding atmosphere of potential danger, until healing allows for the next expansion. I explored these ideas through collaging as I considered materials and scales, interested in how to create this sensation of dysphoria to an audience. The departure from the fetishized foot and the heel forms is inspired by embryos, cocoons and abstract formations of cartilage and flesh created through collaging. The forms became symbolic of an internal human experience, transient and immaterial, but in need of talismanic representation. The vital part of the process was detaching from an ideal expectation of the wax mold from the plaster cast, instead moving into the unknown. Working with alchemical concoctions of latex, wax and paint poured into the structure, subverting the process of conditioning. To move beyond the gaze I had to take risks and bake the mold open with excitement about what reactions were at play inside the cast. As I levered open the plaster cast, halves of the mold latex and paint rushed out through every opportunistic gap and hole seeping out of the idealized form. Inside was true beauty undefined, resonant of flesh and bone, a pregnancy exposed and continual as the materials needed to coagulate before a form could be fully released. The weight-bearing human foot transmuted its semiotics from a desired product of a gender performance to a cognizance and embodied exposing the durational zigzagging of transformation. The form had become a new fetish object for ritual, an icon of my queerness, imbued with personal rights and psycho-spiritual presence, existing for occult purpose, as a talisman signifying the intricate psychological processes of, of alignment to an authentic self beyond the destructive experience of the gender binary. This process has been fundamental to my transition from gaze to prismatic lens as the infections of the gender binary on my previous works had become clear.
Auto-expression. Words, words, words are intrinsic to my practice, written, spoken, and shaped on the page. I value my automatic poetry as prophetic to my practice, as thematic phrases appear from the unconscious and germinate the becoming of polyamorous artworks, where I layer and echo my voice in sound works, where the logos and pathos vibrate as mantras in rhetorical recitations, oscillating between interpersonal anxiety, self-definition, and social commentary. In 2020, I extended my automatic writing practice to involve autoethnography as a research method to investigate my childhood memory. This was also a bid to unearth the roots of recurring themes and material interest in my work. This allowed for a new phase of auto poems that were intuitively extracted from monkey texts as lines that have a psychic charge and emotional trigger. I formed the poem Milk Teeth and made a film by the same name. This practice revealed interactions with symbolic objects that codify gender, one of these being tights. I became aware I share this material significance with other artists as I unpack how I am situated in the discussion of a symbol that both signifies gender performance, inclination and erotic charge. As my childhood encounters with tights was an intervention into understanding my body and pleasure to be other than what it had been prescribed to be. As an adult I found myself enraptured by curator Zoe Bordeaux Gossamer exhibition at Carl Friedman Gallery where the interpretations and gendered employment of tights embodied and performed by cis, heterosexual and queer artists in a potent materiality was stretched between eroticism, feminism, discomfort and beauty. The distinct differentiation of organism versus eroticism being conveyed by the artists is explicit, where Borland manifests creatures that are simultaneously volcanic and abeyant, metamorphic and familiar in a surreal displacement of the daily worn domestic materials into abstract iconography of femininity ingesting itself in a rebellion of reformation. Fakim's Tehran prostitutes are the antithesis to Joan's fetish symbols, where erections were signified in feminist analysis, there are flaccid embodiments, in slumped honesty as bulges protrude over necklines and fruit signified breasts, a common symbolic representation of female form as food and domestic object. Wrinkled leather boots flop aimlessly like stuffed sausages with spikes on the ends. Berenho employs dolls like Belmer, but these raggedy dismemberments pass through ladder tights like pathologies, heterotopias clogging up umbilical cords like depressed egg sacs in decay, forming a creature that lurks in attics, staining brown with age. My practice had continually returned to tights as a material. The automatic writing compounded this recurrence as the memory of my mum stuffing tights with scrunched newspaper to create a cat's tail for my fancy dress birthday party costume had emerged from. My relationship to the material is layered and complex in both its playfulness and psychoactive charge as a symbol of gender and instrument of the othering. An infraction of authenticity previously processed as a perversion that I can now emancipate from the shackles of shame induced by the gender binary. The autoethnography practice was entwined in the production of a series of autotexts and portraits called osmosis, where I used tights, my photographic archive, and interventions to fracture time between the child and adult self, merging the two to create new abstractions, knowingly deformed with multiple eyes and twisted features, expressing a psychic timeline of gnarled growth. The procedure. I ripped my child self into pieces and laid out on paper in front of me. Like shards of mirror, I stared back at myself, broken into multiple pieces, a heterotopia blinking from the floor. Ripping up the images, I am reminded of the cutting of the photograms how violent transformation can be. Comparing myself from two different worlds of age and knowledge, corrupted in weight, lying vulnerably on the floor, I began the reformation. Retaining some physiological sense to the composition with eyes at the top, followed by noses and down to my mouth. Organizing the pieces I am performing a surgery on the broken mirror and finding new pathways for the disorientated puzzle to fit together and fold itself through time into a new bone structure. For eye creases to meet and merge into elevations of nostril, where the nose bridges to and from many times, to find a lip and a mouth to speak silence from. I heal the Frankenstein collage by drawing it, as a surgical performance of seamlessly stitching shade and colour. Witnessing the new apparition, I realise staring up at me is a vision of the deformity caused by identity oppression under the gender binary. 
years of memory, inclination, desire and shame knotted up like gnarls of twisted trunk, self-ingested and regurgitated on the page through inquiry, performance, collage, deconstruction and reformation, an image of a birth. Here I am, look what you made me, my portrait says back at me in a spiteful alliance. A morning of inquiry emerges from this new evidence and my sudden disdain to societal structures that condemn difference and create otherness. Multiplicities of form have manifested, revealing another presence of my absence due to the gender binary's effects. Witnessing fractured parts of myself reunited like distant family members at a funeral, reconnecting through this transgressive methodology. I'm reminded of the sound piece for the six-legged dog film, as I proclaim, society as well by which I mean we are mercurial, with the ability to melt ourselves into shapes that appease others, to avoid confrontation and to survive. But as this process of repressive deformity begins, integration and harmony of self are sacrificed to uniformity under normalization, that is performed until a seeping out of internal discomfort begins, mutated under perfected exteriors. The wax melts to reveal no foundational structure or framework for the corrupt misfit as the entanglements of oppression surface from shadow. Until trans men and women measure their gender by their identity, rather than an external cisgender cultural norm, which is often unattainable for many cisgender people too, there will always be the potential for mental health problems, as trans people measure themselves and find themselves lacking. This self-measuring world propagates the presence of absence, with hauntings from shadow, mutating through the wound like a portal, in a mirrored projection of self that is steeped with the uncanny as we project to identify, to assimilate within and survive the panopticon. A collection of our milk collection of our milk a collection of our milk tea. Yellow and bones of our past blood and bones going brown like brown 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 at the bottom of the stairs. At the bottom of the stairs. At the bottom of the stairs. Always smiling. Always smiling. Always smiling. Present of absence. Present of absence. Present of absence. Newspapers scrunched state of pair of state of times. I hold gouged out gouged out gouged out mysterious 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 my head. Curios of a curios of a curios of a static schedule and escapism. Mannequin hand, tight out the door and over my hand, a large puddle accumulated on the floor, on the floor, on the floor, umbilical cord, umbilical cord, umbilical cord. I was alone, I was alone, older, older, big lead and gently, and lead and gently, extremely pleased, extremely pleased, extremely pleased. When you're naked, the monsters can get into you. My naked body saved under the water garment, fashion and air using my t-shirt, something bad, something bad, something bad. Hurry us away, hurry us away, lie, Mouse to feed, mouse to feed, mouse to feed, wrong. Destruction was the destruction name of the, the game, of the game, of the game. Tears stream from my eyes, stream from my eyes, drenching my, my body as much as the rain, as my body as much as the rain. Out to sea, looking out to sea, to the storm, morning, watching, watching, wait, watching, wait. The cold, enabled, cold, ghosts, ghosts. for performance has birthed uncanny avatars 
where projections of the Medusa, Shadow and Anima have all appeared. Paradoxically, as expressions of the gendered silencing and the emergence and amplification of the transitional voice and cosmetic lens, the largest of the avatar forms takes on the presence of a tumor that has grown in shadow of my psyche since the first laceration to my wound, digesting and gestating below a surface of unconscious denial and enforced amnesia. As I swallowed again and again the lumps of conditioning, forcing them down into the psychic shadow gut as an intestine of mourning festering inside. This uncanny form is emblematic of my experience on this master's course, as I have spilled my guts on the floor like a divining tool, hanging them up for dissection and debate. Who, who, how, how, what, 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 what? Passing my heel sculptures through the avatar was like witnessing a birth, a rebirthing of a life cycle fully transitioned into a new object and subject, a new what in the tubes of connectivity. It was never the intention, but the wax cast became free again, transformed from their misogynistic beginnings into a new genderless form. For the first time, as the weight of the heavy wax heels hung and stretched the lycra of the tights to its fullest potential, suspended over the heterotopic mirror, presented as both observer and a reflection, the tights signified resilience and strength, not gendered performance or infantile perversion. Organism is eroticism, asks my uncanny avatar. The transcendence of gender and potency of a primordial inheritance allows for a reorientation with a post-binary sexuality and desire. A redescription of organs, genital and digestive, turns from the infectious gaze to a cosmic clonic irrigation, a sleeping beauty extracted to a new autonomy of explicit multiplicities. I explore this new autonomy in the film, The Nude is on the Metal, where cellular activity is layered into psychogeographical sites, including the return to the staircase. As I continue to explore the concertina of time, facilitated through the projector's illuminations as portals and heterotopias, the pixels transposing the digital data of cells rushing in vast scales across my avatar guts, suspended in abstract spaces and gushing around the heterotopias of my body, the staircase and reflections of the moon. The atmosphere is similar to the horror movies of the 1980s I watched with my brother when we were children, like toad poopers poltergeist, and I am in inside, inside the television, the television set. set. But my horror is a safe space where others look in bewildered at myself and choose to capture. In a psychological room where anachronisms and voyeuristic collisions birth new evaluations of beauty and form, the revolution will be televised or posted to my Instagram at least. Through automatic writing practices, this psychic projection of form has manifested as a physical heterotopic ossification through the materiality of types. I can see the avatar also as an apparition of the cosmic caterpillar who appeared in my writing during the Osmosis series as a universal energy of abundant potential where souls take shape prior to bodily or species prescription. It could also be the Medusa's serpentine body laying in dismemberment as apparitions of her head and gaze are in high demand of male exploitation and weaponization elsewhere. Like the heel forms that are now conjoined to it, this is a trans fetish form, an effigy of bodily regression to a primordial energy imbued with rights after a hero's quest of transformation, beyond the gaze, but in return to the world of the looking. There are two sisters. One gives birth to the other and she in turn gives birth to the fair queen. What now? now? I see my practice like the riddle of the Sphinx from the Oedipus myth. My imagery fuses, reinterprets and undulates, ingesting and birthing new facets of a prismatic lens that has become holographic by nature, form and projection. All encompassing the same preoccupation with an identity that is fragmented and remains partly submerged in shadow after years of amnesia and dysphoria. Yet every artwork tilts the surface, exposing new banks and edges of the archaeological site. The recurring themes in my work narrate this experience as I frame the wound as the effects of the gender binary under patriarchy. The presence of absence as the dysphoria and dissociation to identity, gender and sexuality. The projected pixel portals and uncanny avatar as automotive modes to relive and encounter psychic apparitions of anima, shadow and childhood inclinations that were relegated to shadow via shame. 
It was important to work retroactively with the Heel series and use the photograms to dissect the impacts the patriarchal gaze had upon my aesthetics as a way to consolidate a foundation for my departure from it, whilst retaining elements of the language that has evolved from it and culture's entanglements within its roots, specifically in regard to fetishism and misogynistic imagery. I'm not saying fetishism is solely regressive, but it has been important for me to backtrack and understand its presence in my work and where the prevailing language comes from, because in connection to the gender binary it continues to imply conformist ideals that I endeavour to free myself from, meaning a reimagining of fetishism may be needed, a trans fetish to fully transcend the binary, by framing the subjective semiotics of misogyny in the discussed artworks as expressions of the wounds induced by the oppressive gender binary, I am saying that the presence of women and apparitions from shadow projected as the oppressed animal. My conversation around the subversive syntax of fetishism has been to signify violations to infantile dispositions deemed inappropriate to normalization as through a male gaze apparitions transgressively manifest as eroticized avatars, automated in the cold mechanics of the pumped and devices, objectifying the female form and directing its gender performance. Phallocentrism is projected onto the form in a denial of the true castration of the artist's anima at childhood and its transgressive impacts on the representation of women and other what identities. I have evidenced the recurring presence of absence in my work, where gender and sexuality are subverted and fragmented, signifying an ambiguity of autonomy and individuation as a fractious complication between explicit autonomy of artists and the implicit anatomy of subject. Amplifying this dynamic is the process of self-portraiture as a duplicitous presence because of its self-emanating subversive intentions, the esoteric narcissist, beguiling the audience to their own subjective gaze that situates the works at the boundaries of the binary. Here is where the tectonic plates of authentic projection meet with culture and society, in a tense friction causing volcanic outbursts of disdain and critique. Non-binary identities inhabit these disruptive borders, Whilst being umbilically attached to subjective subversion, the process of untangling oneself from the binary is an arduous task. Leaning into trans writers has been incredibly empowering for this purpose, as they are the radical truth sayers that trudge the mud of social density, transcending expectations of image, behaviour and desire from the normalised masses that police the panopticon. I interpret non-binary identities as the living liminal, physical heterotopias navigating the patriarchal systems of power. This is where I situate my work. Existing in these liminal borderlands where the what will not be understood until trans and non-binary epistemologies are more widely introduced. To a degree I am queering some feminist theory by reframing Belmer's doll as an avatar of his subjugated femininity and Jones' incongruence to his anima, continually punished on the canvas, although Jones did explore a potential voice of his painted woman and the hermaphrodite symbol in his works. Reflexively, I have gained an understanding of my own castration complex, as the loss of genitalia is not an anxiety, but a symbolic desire, as I continually appear with no phallus in my artwork as an energetic hermaphrodite figure. I thought I did this because of general censorship and the ability to publish my work, but I understand now that exposing my genitalia prescribes my body, infers homoeroticism as purpose, due to the culture of queer art online, and diminishes the power of the image I purvey, as I become impotent to embody omnipotence. Is this the power of my wound, as another infliction, that through an absence empowers my presence? There is an iconographical aesthetic within my work, reminiscent of deities with halos and animal heads, which connects me back to imagery of sacrifice and worship in relation to the wound and encounters with the divine. Moving beyond the binary has started to return to the psycho-spiritual investigation within my work and my preoccupation with a queer spiritual context. Making sacred one's disposition in opposition must be about forging a legitimacy and access to the privileges a queer person often grows up being denied of. The wound needs icons, archetypes and effigies to heal these rejections and denials, but there is a lack of symbology here, another presence of absence. Specifically for non-binary identifying people who seek a reflection of their heterotopic status and ancestry that can be communicated through symbols. It is here that esoteric teachings of alchemy and hermetics can be looked at for their principles on gender and imagery of the hermaphrodite symbol within the conjunctive 
fourth stage of the alchemical process to spiritual illumination. Esoteric teachings provide historical belief systems that didn't situate queerness as a pathology or criminal act, as Western medicine did. I often mention the germ of potential, which comes from the Kabbalistic teaching of the dawn of time in the human soul, symbolized by a point of consciousness in a cube that opens up to become the hermetic rose cross. It is the essence and identity of your own secret self. The nucleus of the soul is also represented in mandalas as a psychic nucleus interpreted as a mother archetype, resounding with the manifesto text they created, which includes the line, Our bodies are all an image of a birth. I created the automatic text via transgressive methodologies of collage, using the draft pages of this memoir to create a number of mandalas as interventions into the text, from which I transcribed new lines that appeared across the layers of cut paper. Through experimental processes of distillation and fermentation, by recital and recording of the lines as mantras, an essence of my work's subjectivity has emerged as a surreal autobiography by intervention. As a manifesto for new research, the O symbolizes the new germ of potential as a distillation of the text exalts an extreme potency in every line and a communion with my trans methodologies. I think again of the queer mantra and a return to the case of the queer child, spiking my intrigue further of deciphering symbolic germ, the mandala as a mother archetype and my ability to reproduce in my castrated form. I realize the value of my research, conversing through performance and capture, by which constellating my wounds and desires situates my work among new paradigms of epistemologies concerning the multiplicities of the human other through the intimate process of self-portraiture as investigation and conjuring, my methods reveal the evidence to defend the queer child, the living liminal, and the what heterotopia.